Hello, my name is Emily Kroll from the Center for Materials and Sensor Characterization at the University of Toledo. And during this STEM training video, I'm going to give you a background and introduction to scanning transmission electron microscopy. Light microscopes have been around for hundreds of years, and most people have had the pleasure of working with these machines. How light microscopes work is fairly simple, and it all starts with the light source, a light bulb. From there, light is focused by a condenser lens onto the sample. The light shines through the sample and carries on to the objective lens. As the light continues on its path, the light is focused with an ocular lens before it travels to the eyepiece. A transmission electron microscope actually works quite similarly to a light microscope, but instead of using light, it uses electrons. Just as the light bulb is the source of light in the light micro microscope, the electron gun is the source in the TEM. There are condenser lenses in both types of microscopes before the sample. After the sample, there are objective lenses for either the light or the electrons. And there are a number of additional parts in the TEM that are not in the light microscope, such as apertures. Both of them have several lenses, though that work to focus the beams before they reach the eyepiece or the screen in the transmission electron microscope. Because our eyes cannot detect electrons like they can light, an image screen or detector has to be used in order to generate an image. Now, this setup for the TEM is a bit oversimplified. It just gives you a good idea of the basic setup of the machine and how it's going to work. I should also let you know that this TEM setup is actually upside down. I just wanted to show you this way to give you a good comparison to the light microscope. So what is really going on here? Well, let's start with the electron gun, which generates an extremely high energy beam of electrons. This beam of electrons is then shaped and focused by electromagnetic lenses before hitting the sample. The sample has to be very thin for TEM, on the scale of 10 to 200 nanometers thick because it has to be thin enough for the electrons to be able to pass through it. This is why the process is called transmission electron microscopy, because there's a transmission of electrons through the sample. After passing through the sample, the beam of electrons is once again shaped and focused by a set of electromagnetic lenses. Along with lenses, there are also apertures, typically made of m molybdenum, sorry if I pronounced that poorly, <laughs> that can be used to modulate the beam to various degrees of precision. Although pictured here, there's only appearing after the sample holder, apertures can actually be in the path of the beam before and after. All of this is done under a vacuum to minimize molecules in the electron column from interfering with the beam. One last part I'd like to introduce at this point is called a cold trap. This cold trap contains liquid nitrogen and serves for a couple different purposes. First, it can act as a condensation point that can pick up material from the sample reducing the contamination due to carbon migration. Also, this cold point, cold point can help reduce unwanted thermal heating and facilitate different analytical techniques such as EDS or EELS, which I'll cover later. But the direct beam that passes through the sample is not the only way to collect data. Electrons interact with the sample in a number of ways. Let's take a look at this thin sample that is being hit by an electron beam. When the beam hits the sample, it can either go straight through it, or it can be diffracted or scattered. Scattered electrons can either be elastic or inelastic, with the difference being that there is a measurable drop in energy from the inelastically scattered electrons. The beam hitting the sample can also cause an emission of secondary and backscattered electrons. Additionally, characteristic x-rays are also emitted. <laughs> SEM imaging is mainly concerned with the secondary and backscattered electrons which the TEM uses the direct beam through the sample and elastic scattered electrons. The elastic scattered electrons are mainly employed, uh, employed to provide contrast in the TEM imaging. Uh, for those of you that are interested in analysis uh, and characteristic x-rays can be used to run EDS, which is a type of elemental analysis both during TEM and STEM. Lastly, Inelastically scattered electrons can be analyzed in a process called electron energy loss spectroscopy. This is a type of atomic scale analysis run during STEM that reveals elemental features through characteristic core loss edges corresponding to the inner shell excitation into the first available unoccupied space. 
Uh, overall, the TEM can provide imaging, run EDS, and run EELS. All right, so we've talked about light microscopes, TEMs, and even to a degree SEMs. Now it's time to take a look at the real topic of this video, STEMs. The scanning transmission electron microscope is like a combination of the SEM and TEM, and then it gives it a significant advantage. For example, let's take a look at the information that was on the last uh, slide. The SEM imaging is great for surface inspection, and transmission electron mi microscopes can allow for a closer look at the material and identify material properties down to a nanoscale. With a STEM, all of this is possible allowing for a correlation between surface information and bulk information. This is the first advantage to STEM microscopes. Both the TEM and the STEMs were developed in the 1930s, but while there was a rapid development of the TEMs due to their popularity, the STEMs have undergone a slower development. Uh, so how exactly do these TEMs and STEMs differ? It's easiest to start with describing the differences by first looking at the setup of the microscopes and how those vary. We've already touched on the general setup of the TEM. We have the electron gun, the condenser lenses, sample, objective lenses, intermediate lenses, and finally the projector lens. Now let's take a look at the stem. We can see that the two setups are really similar and that they both start out with an electron gun followed by a condenser lens. However, following the condenser lens is where the differences really start. Instead of next going to the sample, the stem is set up such that the sample is actually preceded by a scanning lens and the objective lens. There's also no intermediate lens in the stem, but there are projector lenses. So what is important about this? Well, this setup, there are, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, with this setup, there are two lenses after the sample in the TEM, and those lenses are the source of what's called chromatic aberration. Uh, this is a result of the electron energies being different and thus focused at different focal positions. If that doesn't quite make sense, just hang in there. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later in this presentation. But one important thing to notice about these setups in the stem is that the electron beam is focused on the sample. But in the TEM, the electron beam is not focused. Instead, the beam is much wider when it passes through the sample. All right, so let's get back to this slide. <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, the lenses in the stem are magnetic lenses, and they are made up of copper wire that is coiled and the current, with a current passing through it. The beam that passes through these lenses travel in a spiral trajectory. The end result of the lenses is a demagnification of the electron beam, such that when the beam hits the sample, it forms an atomic scale probe. The objective lens that is positioned just prior to the sample, the sample provides the most demagnification of the beam, and it, is its, and it is the flaws or aberrations of this lens that determines the limit of resolution of the microscope. Let's get back to the aberrations that were mentioned when we were talking about the lenses earlier. The nature of these lenses provides a limitation for resolution via these aberrations. For all of you photographers out there, you may already be, fam be familiar with this term. Um, by, by definition, chromatic aberration is the refraction of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radi radiation through slightly differing angles, resulting in the failure to focus. In this image of the guy, you can see the color on the fringes being separated. This separation is due to the different wavelengths of each of these colors. Here's a perfect lens with no chromatic aberration. All of the different colors of light follow the same path, focus at the same point, and project together. However, with aberration, these colors of various wavelengths all diffract at different angles and have various focus points, thus projecting poorly. How this light behaves is the same as how electrons passing through lenses behave. The electrons are emitted from the gun and all have various energies, and much like the various wavelengths of light, will have slightly different angles when passing through the lenses, such as the electrons that have lost more energy, which are bent more strongly than those with higher energy. Furthermore, the thicker the foils in the lens, the more pronounced the chromatic aberration will be. This is why having lens after the sample in the TEM can lead to increased chromatic aberrations, and thus is considered a shortcoming when compared to the stems. Unfortunately, chromatic aberration is not the only problem with lenses. There's also spherical aberration, which has to do with the shape of the lens or the lens field acting inhomogeneously on the electrons passing through it. 
In the image below, we can see an example of how light lenses would cause spherical aberration. The lenses with no aberration has the beam all focused on the same spot. Each was affected by the lens the same. However, in the image to the right, you can see that not all the, bas the beams pass through uniformly, which causes them to be unfocused. Just like the light lenses, the electromagnetic lenses for the electron beams can have the same effect. The lenses affect the beam inhomogeneously, causing a spherical aberration effect where all of the electrons, or rays, do not converge at the same point. The further the electron is off the axis, the more strongly the electron will be bent back. The equation that governs the effects is this. A constant for the lens, which is called the spherical aberration coefficient, times beta cubed, where beta is the maximum semi-angle of the collection of the objective lens. The spherical aberration coefficient, c sub s, is approximately equal to two times the focal length. Therefore, reducing the focal length is one way to minimize the effects of spherical aberration. There are advances in STEM technology for correcting these aberrations, but the vast majority of STEM machines will not have these additions. There are ways to align various parts of the machine to get ideal images using STEMs, such as the Hitachi HD 2300 that we, hear, that we have here at the Center for Materials and Sensor Characteri Characterization at the University of Toledo. The process that is used to set up and align the microscope starts with the, determining the eucentric position followed by aperture alignment, current center alignment, astigmatism correction, and bright area centering. Over the next few slides, we're going to cover each of these steps and give you a little bit of background on them. The first step of the setup includes finding the eucentric position. The eucentric position is a plane on which the magnification, camera length, and focus are all set. The height is determined by setting the objective lens current to a known setting that is correlated with a specific voltage, followed by adjusting the z-height until focused. When the sample height, in the z-direction, is set at the eucentric position, one can tilt the sample around this axis without the image or the sample moving across the projection screen. While trying to find the eucentric position, the user will first look at a reference point where these specific parameters are known. On the machine, the Z control knob is used to find this position. A way to determine if the eucentric position is found is by adjusting the knob until the focus on the reference point is good. While this step is important for imaging, it is incredibly important for running any sort of sensitive EDS. Another important part to consider is the aperture alignment of step 3. Apertures restrict the amount of beam current that passes, so to restrict the beam size where the aberrations do not lead to a significant blurring. The electrons that do not pass through the aperture are lost. Basically, the aperture strip will look something like this, with holes through which the beam can be passed or filtered out. When this is not aligned, the beam will not be passing through the sample correctly. The image to the left shows an unaligned aperture, while the image to the right shows a properly aligned aperture. One thing to consider is the size of the aperture. Shown here is a movable aperture with various sizes 1 through 4, with 4 being the smallest. The smaller the aperture is, the smaller the beam size will be. This will have multiple effects. First, it will allow for a smaller probe size on the sample and thus better resolution. Uh, but second, this will also reduce the field of view. Once the appropriate aperture has been selected and aligned, the lenses will have to be aligned. The alignment of the objective lens is also known as current centering. This process centers the objective lens field around the optic axis so that the electrons passing through are exposed to a symmetric field. While there are automatic processes for this at lower res resolutions, this is typically done manually at extremely high resolutions. To determine whether this, the current is centered, the user will over and under focus on the sample. If the image wobbles or rotates around the center of the screen without moving off-center, then the objective lens and the current is centered. The next step is all about astigmatism. If you've ever worked with an SEM, then you are very familiar with astigmatism. But for those of you that have not, astigmatism is caused by an asymmetry in the field of the lenses. This non-uniform magnetic field can, uh, uh, can, can be due to imperfections in the cylindrical iron elements. Overall, the effect is streaking or stretching of the normally roundish grains, which make achieving focus more difficult. Luckily, 
there is a way to correct astigmatism with the use of stigmators. These are small octopoles that balance out the inhomogeneity of the field. These stigmators can be found on both objective lenses as well as the condenser lenses. Once again, there are automated processes that can be used to reduce astigmatism, but I suggest doing fine tuning, uh, extreme fine tuning manually. With astigmatism, images will not be clear and focused. Instead, they will look like they're pulled or stretched. Uh, for example, look at the image to the left, which has astigmatism. There's no discernible patterns here. However, the image to the right, which has the astigmatism corrected, looks much clearer. In fact, the lines that uh, you see there indicate crystal planes. This, is, this shows how important it is to correct astigmatism. The last step for alignment is step six, bright area centering. Just like current centering align the objective lens, the bright area centering aligns the projector lens. This centers the visual field so that the electro, so it's at electromagnetically aligned with the center of the screen. Like with many other aligning processes, this is automated at lower resolutions. When you come for training on the, S on the stem, uh, this is what you should expect to see. The specimen exchange is located here on the tower with the Z-control knob attached below. The aperture is here, and the EDS aperture is just below it. Now, the detector for the EDS is just behind this door at the bottom. Also just beyond the door, but above the EDS detector, is the liquid nitrogen tank that we had talked about earlier. If you're planning to run EDS, it's a good idea to check beforehand that the tank has liquid nitrogen in it, because the cool down process does take some time. One element to consider again is spot size. Spot size is the diameter of the final beam on the surface of the specimen. It is the condenser lens that controls the spot size, as well as the beam convergence. By varying the current supplied to the lens, the spot size is adjusted. In a series of condenser lens, it is the first condenser lens that is responsible for the spot size. When the spot size is smaller, this leads to a better resolution picture, meaning that you can increase the magnification and still see the image. However, the beam current is significantly lower and restricts the field of view. You may be wondering how this is different from an aperture. Uh, well, they work together. The aperture is the maximum size that the beam can be. If the spot size would be larger than this maximum size, then the aperture would cut the beam down. So this is, uh, these two elements, the aperture and the spot size, really work together. Practically, the spot size is critical to column setup. For the column setup, we will see a window just like this, with, lo with lots of different options. Uh, we will touch on the wide view mode and the face contrast mode later, but for now I want to cover the operation modes and how it affects the spot size. It is important to note that the higher spot sizes increases resolution, but does decrease beam current. Going over the various operations modes, we may as well start at the top with normal mode. This mode is used for observation and general analysis. The spot size for this mode is approximately 0 0.5 nanometers squared. Next is the EDX, or EDS mode, which is used for EDS area analysis and has a spot size of 1 nanometer squared. Just below that is the high resolution mode. This mode is in fact used for high resolution imaging and it has a spot size of about 0.3 nanometers squared. With an even better resolution and smaller spot size is the ultra high resolution imaging mode, which is used for just that, and has a small spot size of 0.2 nanometers squared. The decon mode is unique compared to the rest. This is an illumination mode where the hydrocarbon molecules are baked off the surface of the sample or are prevented from concentrating in the high resolution mode. Because the hydrocarbons are being burnt off, there can be contamination issues while, while using this mode. The last mode on the list is nanodiffraction mode. This mode uses nanodiffraction probe with a small convergent angle and is used to clearly see is used to clearly see nanodiffraction patterns. Now that we've gone over the basics of transmission microscopy and how the stem works, let's go over the different types of imaging that can be done with stems. When an image is taken with the electrons that have passed through the sample without being scattered, it's known as a bright field. In other words, a bright field detector will include the transmitted beam such that the holes it passes through appear bright, while a dark field detector excludes the transmitted beam, making the holes appear dark. In crystalline samples, the details in the image stem from the result of Bragg's Law, 
which governs the angles at which the electrons will travel when interacting with the crystalline samples. During this imaging mode, complementary backscattered and secondary electrons can be taken, as well as analysis on characteristic X-rays. Another imaging modality is Z-contrast, or high angle annular dark field imaging. This modality is unique to STEMS, adding to the list of advantages of these machines. The Z-contrast images are a bit different than, e than either the standard or the bright, the, either the standard bright field or dark field images. In the bright field image, the beam is scanned over the sample and the beam that's passed through or diffracted is detected below. However, during the Z-contrast detector, it is set so wide that it does not de uh, detect any of the Bragg diffracted electrons, but instead it detects elastically scattered electrons that have passed very close to the atomic nuclei of a sample. Compared to the standard ang angular dark field detector, Z-contrast simply has a larger inner angle, so that it detects only the scattered electrons and none of the Bragg diffracted. Because diffracted electrons can add unwanted contrast, thus making masking structural information, only detecting scattered electrons allows the Z-contrast detector to provide higher resolution images. While it is noticeably different from the standard dark field, it is still a variety of dark field imaging, and you can tell by seeing that the areas where the sample is not present or not very dense is brighter, and where denser parts of the samples are darker. This means that during Z-contrast imaging, the density of the sample directly affects the contrast. Overall, this is a convenient and intuitive mode for revealing atomic arrangement. This is what a Z-contrast or high angle annular dark field image looks like. While the contrast is greatly dependent on density, this imaging modality is less sensitive to thickness and focus than other imaging modes. High resolution imaging allows the user to look closely at the sample and the lattice structure of the sample. This can be used to not only define the lattice structure, but it can also find defects. These images are created by the interference between overlapping convergent beam disks on the detector. This means that the images are a compilation of the disks of the beam that hit the detector. While there are multiple methods of achieving high resolution imaging, one of the easiest and most common methods with the stem microscope is to use a phase contrast mode with a bright field detector. This mode is simply defined by the detection angle that it uses. Even though these images are almost identical to TEM images, the stem phase contrast mode is significantly more advantageous due to the reduced effect of chromatic aberration compared to TEM, as well as its reduced effect of astigmatism and sample orientation when compared to the wide-viewed mode with the bright field detector. Here is a high-resolution image of a glass ceramic. You can see that the ceramic portion has a crystal lattice, and you can see the lines representing the planes. However, the glass around it is amorphous, so there are no crystal lattice present in that portion of the sample. This is one of my favorite STEM images taken here at the University of Toledo. Once again, this is a glass ceramic, and you can see the crystal lattice of the ceramic here. But what is so interesting about this picture is that it not only shows how the denser ceramic portions are darker than the less dense glass, but it also demonstrates how important sample orientation is. The crystal lattice is only visible because it's correctly oriented. However, you can see that the other ceramic portions are not aligned properly for lattice imaging so you can't see any of the crystal lattices at these points. During diffraction imaging, the crystal lattice of the sample acts as a diffraction grating, allowing some of the electrons to pass through while diffracting the rest. The atoms that interfere with the path of the beam create an interference pattern, which is collected as the beam travels out of the lattice. This interference pattern provides information about the structure and crystalline nature of the material. This behavior is once again governed by Bragg's law. Here's an example of what a diffracted image looks like. Such selected area electron diffractions are used to obtain spot diffraction patterns of crystals. These diffraction patterns reveal the nature of the crystalline phases of the specimen. For example, if the material is microcrystalline or amorphous, the diffraction pattern consists of a series of concentric rings rather than these spots. Here, you can see the image of the setup of the microscope the location of the different detectors in the various imaging and analysis modalities, as well as the lenses and apertures. One of the greatest advantages of the STEM is that multiple detectors can be used simultaneously to give different views of the sample, which provides different but complementary information. 
For example, in the image to the left, you can see the diffraction, and it's complementary to the secondary electron image on the right. Thank you so much for watching this video on the introduction to scanning transmission electron microscopy. I hope you enjoyed it.